Good morning. Welcome to the 15th FTTH conference and the beautiful city of Valencia. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you today morning, Your Excellency, our distinguished plenipotentiaries, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. What place could be better to discuss technology, policies driving fiber investments, and the financing aspect of fiber networks than the country of Spain, which is a front runner in fiber deployment as well as digitalization. It is my great honor to welcome our opening keynote speaker, His Excellency Alvaro Nadal, the Spanish Minister for Energy, Tourism and the Digital Agenda. Don Alvaro Nadal, please join me on stage to deliver your opening keynote. <laughs> Good morning to, to everyone and welcome to, to Valencia, here to Spain. Um, and thank you for allowing me to, to, to start, to inaugurate this conference, which is one of the main issues in order to develop a digital agenda. Uh, when uh, the, the ministry in the, this legislative term was changed its name from telecommunication to digital agenda, to, everybody told me, why? Why this change? Because uh, this is not about telecommunication networks anymore. Telecommunication networks are key in the developing of the sector and the technology and the whole change in civilization that's going on in, in this 21st century. But this is not the only point. So if you allow me, I can tell you what do we think a pure digital agenda should be, and then we go down to infrastructure, which is this Congress about. Uh, first point is... Uh, of course, infrastructure. We need to develop infrastructure. Without infrastructure, we don't have anything at all. It's like trying to have the automobile industry without roads. It's clear. You are experts in this matter, much better than me. But it is true that we don't have only an automobile industry with roads. We need much more than that. So the great challenges of our society is not only to develop infrastructure in, an in, in, in a right way, in an adequate way, but also to have an industry and to make the rest of the sectors to participate in the digital revolution, which is not easy at all. So what can we do in order to foster digital industry? As I always saying, once we've got the infrastructure, and we, uh, I'll tell you later on of what we are doing in the Spanish government for infrastructure and how the Spanish model has been very successful. But once we've got this infrastructure, how do, we develop, how do we develop a digital industry? And I think we've got two important bottlenecks, especially here in Europe and especially here in Spain. One is financing. We don't have a model of financing of the digital industry that deals with risks, pulls risk in the way we would like it to have. We could, you go to banks, usually banks, what do, do, they do is just to provide loans and mortgages. We need something else, something totally different. And here in Europe, we need a big push to a change on how we need to finance the whole change, the whole revolutionary change in the digital sector. Second is education and skills. We need many more people learning maths, learning physics, learning chemistry, this kind of typical scientific uh, subjects that are going to be the key for the workers, not only in the near future, right now. Uh, in Europe, only two of each five high school students study, uh, study uh, pure science. It's not a great number. We need many more. And we need to foster new ideas and new services. I mean, people are very clever. Governments don't make the innovations. We allow for innovations, but we don't make the innovations, but we can help. For example, we can change the way public services are carried out. Yesterday, I was with the Ministry of, uh, with Minister of Employment and the, and the Deputy Prime Minister uh, and the Minister of Social Issues developing a new social card. It's going to be totally digital, and it's going to uh, have in there all the different subsidies and aids that all different administrations are giving to a certain person are going to have a map, a real-time map for the first time of all sorts of, all sorts of social uh, subsidies and help that we are 
providing to the people. This is very new, and it's going to allow us a lot how to do. For example, we are working uh, at the Ministry of, of Tourism to think how to improve the knowledge about tourists in Spain. Spain is a, you know all, it's a tourism superpower, second in the world. Um, okay, but we want to know where the people come from. We still have some people making surveys uh, in the airports. Well, we've got the roaming data. Roaming data is very useful to know what people are doing, where they come from, what do they visit. Uh, so it's a huge change that's going on. We need to think about uh, data and to regulate properly data. So first point, we need to do uh, many things in order to foster this digital sector and these digital platforms. Secondly, how do we uh, make other sectors understand the importance of the digital revolution? And this is very important as well. I think we need social, political, and mediatic focus. It's the most important thing. Somebody that's doing, I don't know, uh, steel or manufacturing you know, cars, they know what they, what they do because they're all thinking about the connected car. But many other industries, perhaps the olive oil, I, I don't care. Uh, they all must think that there is a wide range of possibilities out there to improve their production, the, the, how to reach to their, to their clients, how to improve logistics. And I think it's more a matter of, of having out of focus from the political side, from the mediatic side, from the social side, on the idea that we are in the middle of a revolution so important or even more important than what happened, for example, 100 years ago with electricity. Third point, which I think is very important, the, di the digital revolution is changing our way of life in the sense that we need to think very wide in order to protect our constitutional and civil rights. Intimacy has changed a lot with the net, totally. How do we protect that, our children? How do we protect them now? Because all our constitutions are analog. They are not digital. So we need to think how to change the important rules, the base rules of our societies in order to protect the, our individual rights in the same way as we have been protecting them in the, in the analog time. Um, for example, here in Spain, we have created a group of experts, uh, uh, lawyers, sociologists, technologists, thinking about how do we protect our, uh, our rights as we have been, have been protecting them. And another very important point, now cybersecurity is as important in the security of a country as the normal police service has been in the past. In the digital world, we need a lot of effort coming from cybersecurity. And we need to make people understand they, uh, in the same way that they lock a car or their houses, they need to protect their computers and their smartphones. And this is also very important as well, and a whole change that's going on, but probably not at the, at the, at the, at the right pace. We need to be faster in this. Taxation. If you go to the VAT directive in the European Union, they say that the tax must be paid when the physical uh, good is, uh, is, is given to the, to, the, to the customer. Come on, in the digital world, how does it work? It makes no sense. Direct and indirect taxation probably will have to change dramatically uh, in this technological, in this digital revolution. Um, I think more or less this would be the whole bunch of ideas we should have in a digital agenda. At European level, at national level, I'm talking at European level because many of our competences are shared in the European Union. But going down to infrastructure, which is the key, as I was saying before, it's important to know that uh, we should be asking, I mean, when I say we, uh, every, everybody, the society in general, we should be asking all political powers to invest in digital infrastructure more than the what is asked for, for example, transport infrastructure. I am a minister, I go here to Valencia, probably I will listen to so many business people telling me that they want a new road there, or they want to enlarge the airport somewhere else, or they want a new port somewhere else. Of course, transport infrastructure is important, but right now, Digital infrastructure is much more important than transport infrastructure, much more. And by the way, much less expensive. For the cost 
of 100 kilometers of, high, of a high-speed train, we can, we can improve between 10 and 15 percentage points the coverage of fiber in a country. So it's quite a deal. From a political point of view, it's quite a deal. And it allows people to reach possibilities, digital possibilities that uh, they couldn't imagine before. And it's also a way of uh, allowing sparse, dispersed remote areas to have the same level of services and the same standard of living as high density areas. And it's also a way to reduce the economic uh, differences. Because it allows people from anywhere to work and to, and, to, and, to, and to participate in the most important and advanced and growing and, and high growing sectors in the economy. So infrastructure is key. And you are doing the cornerstone of the system. It's not, as I was saying before, just with infrastructure, we won't have the best digital revolution. But it's impo impossible to have the best digital revolution without that infrastructure. In the cases of Spain, as you know, we have covered with uh, last generation networks, fiber mainly, 85% uh, of our population right now. Our goal is to go as fast as possible to 100%, or at least to 100% of all villages in the country. Uh, and this is the effort we are trying to make. Why, have been, uh, why Spain has been able to develop that so rapidly and so widely? I think there are three main reasons. First, uh, good regulation, which is not only a stable and foreseeable regulation for allow, allowing for investment, but also uh, removing bottlenecks and obstacles in the regulation. Uh, whatever operators need to develop the infrastructure, we provide them with that. For example, here in Spain, we allow operators to go from façade to façade of, of, of any house uh, with no restriction at all. They are allowed to do that. We remove any kind of problems they might have uh, with property rights or with, with uh, urbanism rules or regulations, things like that. Secondly, which is very important, we as government haven't, uh, in the past, not only now, in the past as well, we haven't been very greedy. When we were have been asking operators, especially when they were buying a spectrum, for, um, for wireless networks, we didn't ask too much money. But in exchange of that, we ask for regulatory obligations to develop networks. So you are going to keep, as operator, your uh, money in your pocket, but you need to invest that in new, in new networks. And invest properly, better with ducts that, that, than simply the trench. So it allows for rapid development and a low cost. And at the same time, while we were developing transport uh, infrastructures, we were forcing all operators in the transport networks to allow and to develop fiber, which is also important. It has uh, allowed to create a, a quite dense grid, a quite dense network uh, for, um, in, the main, in the main lines of, the, of, of this fiber development or deployment. And third, we have been using public money, which is important as well. Market cannot provide enough demand for a full development of the infrastructure. Understanding that this is like it was electricity 100 years ago. Only to those parts where demand allowed for development of electricity grids would have left a big part of the country without electricity. But electricity, sooner or later, was going to become a first need uh, uh, item, good, and at the same time was going to become vital for any production or consumption activity. So sooner or later, you will have to develop that infrastructure. That happens the same with fiber. Fiber and, of course, uh, high-speed uh, digital networks are going to be needed everywhere. So the sooner we start, the better. And if we do it efficiently, at a low cost, 
then there is no excuse at all not to develop them. And that's what we think as government. And then it comes another important point. We have reached at a, a moment, and I think you will agree with that, knowing more than me, because I'm not a, a technological expert, in which there is no such a thing as a division between fixed networks and wireless networks. Now they are symbiotic. With 5G, they are symbiotic. So it's impossible. Some people might have the, the temptation to think, OK, I don't need to, inv to invest that much in fixed networks because I will have the possibility to develop 5G. That's nonsense, and we know all that. They will have to be developed at the same time. And one helps to the other. Because we are talking about, if we are thinking about a highway, it's changing from four lanes to how many? 400 lanes, <laughs> because what's going to happen? It's a total change in the technology. It's a total change of possibilities. And probably we don't know how we are going to use this broadband capacity. The developments are starting right now. We can have some intuition of what might happen. But in 30 years now, we are going to be amazed of what's going to change, because the possibilities are huge. The more we enlarge the band, the more applications, services, and ideas come. And the most badly needed, then, is that kind of infrastructure. So I'm very happy to be here because I think we are talking about the future. We are talking about what's going, and it's already changing the world. And it's the base of the system. And we need to uh, be very uh, sensitive in our public policy about this. Very, very sensitive. Because the future of all our nations is linked to what, how we are going to do so, well or bad in this technological revolution. Uh, main actors of today were the successful actors in the former technological revolutions. And as I was saying before, infrastructure is the cornerstone. It's where over that infrastructure we build the rest. So this conference has all the, I think, all the, all the ingredients for success. Uh, I like the social focus that this and, and, and mediatic focus that this conference provides, not only here to Spain, but to the rest of the world. And I'm very grateful to you, because uh, being in politics, we like to talk about long-term issues and things that really change society for the better. And you are doing that job. Thank you very much.